Hello, this is day five of Who. Okay, I'll make this quick. This is the first of the missing uh, classic episodes that I'm probably going to have to tackle here. I want to take time to, here to bring my thoughts and thanks to the status of all the master copies that, uh, and why more or less there are missing episodes in the first place. And also to spotlight some of the efforts that have been made to save them. Now, here's a history lesson for those who just have no clue. In the 60s and 70s, TV was still a very young medium. Live TV was much more common than recorded television, mainly because it had huge technical hurdles that were still needed to be sussed out at the time. A big common method was early videotape, uh, which more or less looked like giant-ass spools. Uh, they were larger than a pizza box for the most part. And also, there was a lot of legal red tape involved as well. Actors, writers, etc. were not pleased with the idea of just recording their one performance over and playing it over and over again, while only being paid a small amount for the first time only. Reruns were very uncommon at the time. So, TV stations were stuck with these big rolls of film that they couldn't use anymore. Home video was more or less non-existent. Not even more or less. It was completely non-existent. And all they had was this tape that took up space. Also, getting new tapes were expensive. So at the time, it just made sense to wipe and reuse. This ended up destroying tons of possible television history. Now, efforts have been made to recover episodes. And over the years, um, apparently soon, according to the news, if you want to believe it, though the BBC has confirmed it, s stuff has been found. Says stuff that has been discovered since this recording, doing a little edit here, so forgive the unprofessionalism, was the remainder of Enemy of the World, which only one episode had existed, and four episodes of Web of Fear, leaving only one missing episode of that story. So, yeah, 50th anniversary's been a good year so far. Thumbs up. Uh, the, main, the main effort that uh, had been done was to go to uh, stations where... Copies have been made and sold for syndication. Um, a lot of this is thanks to con to a lot of different countries, uh, specifically Australia. You're welcome. Man, the fresh Mentos, the fresh maker. And of course, thanks to dedicated fans back in the day who recorded the sound off of their televisions, and then later gave them to the BBC, who took it, cleaned it and added narration so they work more like an audio play. That's how we're going to be experiencing this story today, The Celestial Toy Maker. And I'm kind of glad because there's a big point in mentioning the whole radio play aspect because it's going to be important in a little bit. Now, before I go on, I was honestly looking forward to this. I've heard the title Villain and Idol... I've heard the title Villain and Audio Plays and was curious to see his debut. And, so far, at the moment, only television appearance. <sighs> Sadly, I was sort of left in the dust on this one. And before I really go on, I better get the good bits out of the way. The toy maker is played by Michael Goth. Yeah, you know, Alfred from the Tim Burton Schumacher Batman movies. and is more or less the gem in this coal mine. He feels like a strange cosmic being who more or less just looks at us as dolls to play with for his game and has the power to back it up. Most of his scenes are just him playing off of Hartnell in a room staring at each other. And that was more because Hartnell was suffering from illness at the time uh, and more or less had to have a role reduced, at least to a point where all he had to do was sit in a chair and talk. It's also worth mentioning that uh, at the beginning of the story, he was turned invisible. And, of course, this was clearly done to, you know, have him not be there, but have him voiced over in post. And also, it's been said that this might have been the point where Hartnell would have been replaced by a different actor, because his illness was becoming that much of a problem that they were very much considering it early on. This was in Season 3, and they only finally let Hartnell go for another actor in small beginning of season four. 
we're of course going to get to that, so I'll have a lot of thoughts to say on it. However, Goth and even Hartnell together are the highlight. They more or less are playing this like a very intense game. A game that could mean life or death to themselves, maybe even the universe. They're doing with a really powerful threat here. So let's get to the majority of the plot, which features our two companions, Steven Taylor. Of course I miss you, babe, and I don't want to miss a thing. Bite me voiceover, and Dodo. Dodo came in a few stories before, kind of stupidly and without no rhyme or reason. Literally, she just walks into the TARDIS, more or less says, no one will ever miss me, and uh, that's kind of it. And Dodo is not a loved companion either. I've only experienced her in two stories. Well, three, counting the ones she shows up in at the very end. But that barely counts because, well, she shows up in the very end. There is also the Ark, which more or less had Dodo destroy an entire civilization because she had a cold. And this one, where she almost got herself and Steven killed because she has the attention span of a goldfish. I'm serious. The only reason this story keeps on going is because, well, Dodo keeps screwing it up and almost gets the damn people killed. Yay. <coughs> so, on top, so, when we're not given the great old g glimpses of, of, of the Doctor talking to Batman's one right-hand man, we're dealing with people, dealing with other people, playing, well, more or less a really, really boring version of that game show on the hub that's based on other uh, board games that Hasbro has rights to. And that's another thing about this one that's really, really weak here. A majority of them, when it's not just Dodo acting like a moron, is the actors running through a set. And honestly, the episodes become so reliant on the visuals, even if this is 60s television, that you kind of need it to understand what the hell's going on. Yeah, there's narration going on, but that can only do so much. Showing and telling really does play a factor here, and unfortunately this story's at a disadvantage where showing was much more effective than telling. And honestly, that goes to the old adage, if your story relies on the effects, you're not telling a great story. And that's the big thing about this that just breaks my heart, is... I was really excited to finally get the chance to experience this, and I just felt so disappointed, and I can't really tell you I feel bad about it. Oh, before I go, this one's also known for having a character use the N-word. No, no, why? I also have no idea why it's so... Well, why the hell it still exists? But it does. Racism is bad, kids. <laughs>